when we were thinking about who to have here tonight, um, he's just spectacular. Many of you have seen his movement, and it's a real movement. So during the lockdowns, uh, there were people that decided to just kind of stay at home and do nothing. This church opened up as a, and was courageous and bold. But this man started a movement. Now, I know you're going to get kind of confused when he comes up on stage, some of you that don't know him. He looks like a liberal. I give him a hard time all the time. He's got long hair. He looks like a 1960s hippie. He's got, but it's okay. We'll give him a hall pass. Um, I'm totally kidding. But he went around the country and did these open air revivals that brought thousands of people to the Lord in the midst of the lockdown. And I started to get these messages from people, and they said, Charlie, you got to look at the Sean Foyt guy. So I endorsed Sean back personally when he ran for Congress in California, and I was so moved by his story. And I started to see Sean attract crowds of thousands and then tens of thousands. And then I saw the opposition. I saw all of a sudden local governments try to lock him down. I saw the satanic response to what Sean was doing when everyone was supposed to stay at home. He was bringing people into the streets to go glorify the Lord. And Sean, you know, he'll do a better job than I will of actually talking about how this is not a political thing at all. It's about glorifying God. But guess what? Politics actually started to involve himself in his ministry because you had secular politicians that say, hey, you can go protest in a BLM rally, but if you're coming to go glorify God, you're not allowed to do that. And he was, the, the tour that he put on in the last year and a half, you should, it's unbelievable, one of the most ambitious, and one of the, and I'll say this, I, I will put him up against anybody, and I am by no means know everybody in the space, but I don't think anybody worked as hard and did more effective open air revivals in as many cities as Sean Foyt did in the last two years, and it's a great honor to have him here tonight. Sean, get on up here. See, you see the hair? So, <laughs> Just tricks people. Yeah, there you go. Sean, welcome to Dream City, man. And just God bless you, you for all the work you've been doing, seriously. This church is amazing. You guys are incredible. Thank, we thank God for you all across America. Pastor Tommy, thank you so much. Beautiful place. So Sean, tell us about your movement, Let Us Worship. It was a brilliant um, idea that you then put the work into. I mean, you spent hundreds of days away from home over the last year and a half, and you came under intense opposition. Just walk us through all that. Yeah, so uh, leading up to the pandemic, I had spent um, about 20 years investing into really the most persecuted, closed nations in the world. My parents are both full-time medical missionaries, so I grew up in a missionary home. And so um, I had been in places like North Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, a lot of places across the across the world, and I didn't really care that much about America, to be honest. I mean, just truthfully, I was just like, you know what, America's heard the gospel, let's move on, you know, uh, they had their chance, you know? And then I started having kids, and I have four now, ages 11, nine, seven, and three. We've been fruitful, we've multiplied, and I started to think about what is this nation going to look like for my children? And I started to get concerned, and of course, I'm living in California where the polarization is great and where, you know, the intensity is great, but yet also the revival history is great. And um, so anyway, when the lockdowns happened, uh, I wasn't shocked, because I just run for Congress, right, in a, in a very, very purple, well, they told me it was a purple district, it was actually a blue district, <laughs> which I found out, um, in the Bay Area, and I, I discovered, I peeked behind the veil right, of Gavin Newsom and Pelosi and all this stuff happening in California. And I knew that there was an agenda at play during the lockdowns. Casinos were open, strip clubs were open, it was fine to go to Costco, but the church was the super spreader, you know. And so I thought, okay, let's start a, let's first galvanize people, right, because I wasn't shocked the government was doing what it was doing. I was shocked that so many people were complying. So I'm sitting there in my house, right? This is, this is, I don't know if I've ever told this story like this, but I did a pledge. I called the pledge, let us worship. I circulated it online. Really sent it for all my friends in New York, California, states that were really locked down. I said, sign this pledge, let's take a stand. And then I was sitting at home and I was getting these direct messages from my underground church pastor friends in Iraq, 
in India, in Afghanistan, and they were saying, you're not gonna let the governor do that to you, right, Sean? <laughs> Come on, you spent enough time with us. You know what to do. And they were egging me on. And so I said, okay, we gotta do something. Let's put feet to this pledge. And so I put a post up on, on social media and I said, let's join me at the Golden Gate Bridge tomorrow. Let us worship. And I didn't know if anyone would come. San Francisco was really locked down. And um, we showed up and 400 people showed up on the Golden Gate Bridge. And I wanna share this and then, and then I can, you know, you can ask me more questions, but what really shocked me, guys, was when we walked onto the bridge and, and you know, first they were like, what are you guys here for? What are you marching for? And we said, we're here for Jesus. We're here to pray. And they said, what took you so long? We met these policemen that were on suicide patrol. They had bicycles and they were on suicide patrol across the Golden Gate Bridge. And we told them we came there to pray and they started breaking down, weeping. They said, you have no idea what we're experiencing. People are jumping to their deaths. So many people every day. We can't stop them all. And I had, I begun to realize the toll that this pandemic was taking on Americans. The, the story we weren't seeing. The story of isolation, depression, heartache, discouragement, despair, and how the church wasn't even open to meet those needs. And so that really motivated us. We, we, we launched an accidental movement. The next day we showed up in Huntington Beach. A thousand people were there. A few days later we showed up in San Diego. 5,000 people showed up on the beach in San Diego. And a movement was born. You went to Portland, or was it Seattle, where they tried to unplug your stuff? And yeah, Seattle and Portland, and Tifa showed up real strong <laughs> and destroyed our gear, threw our stuff down. We got maced, we got pepper sprayed, we got harassed. We had blood poured on us from Satanists. I mean, we went into, and you know, because I had gone into some of these gnarly places around the world, I felt like, like we can't just look at Seattle and Portland and think, like, that's just like in North Korea. Like, we're called to bring light to darkness. So we didn't go to the suburbs of Seattle. We went into CHOP. We didn't go into the suburbs of Portland. We went to downtown right near the courthouse where they were burning copies of the Bible. And, and did the government give you some pushback? How, what, was the, what was the process of getting through yeah, that? Yeah, well, I mean, in Seattle, they kind of defunded the police. So we took that to our advantage. Um, in Portland, the, uh, <laughs> in Portland, the police just didn't show up at all, which was kind of like, all right, uh, we'll have to fend for ourselves. But in, in Portland, you know, the, the, the chaplain of the police department called me, and he was real sweet, and he's like, man, we can't protect you. It's crazy. There's a gang of, of, of teenagers that are knifing people at night. We can't even find out who they are. There's so much murder. Don't do this. Um, and, 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 but then when we went back to Seattle the second time, the city barricaded the park. In Chicago, we had 100 Lightfoot sent 100 police officers after us to close the park down. Um, in Tempe, Arizona, I got, I got a court case here. In this, I still have a court case here because of what we did in 2020 and a big fine I got to pay. So, yes, we have faced tell, resistance. Tell, tell us about that one. The one here? Yeah. Well, it was weird because... People were so sweet and so nice, and we showed up, and, and uh, you know, I, I think they were having trouble issuing a permit, and I said, well, you know, they just had a, you know, protest rally here. We're just going to do a protest for Jesus. You call it a protest, you can get away with it, you know? So we had 10,000 people that showed up in Tempe. The police, we invited the police on stage. We had a beautiful moment where we prayed over the police. They prayed over us. And the city began to interview the police and ask them. They wrote up this really nice report. This was the most amazing event we've ever had. And then the city fined us thousands of dollars. So anyway. Tempe? Yes, Tempe. Yeah. Um, not shocked. Uh, so, so this movement, in some ways, you started with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of response. But then, Sean, you started to see some of the fault lines that already existed in the church. So first came the controversy of whether or not the church should be open. Talk a little bit about kind of what you learned in that process of churches that were seemingly pretty bold previously, and then they just shut their doors, and they wanted nothing to do with you. In fact, they might have attacked you. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, that was really sobering, you know? I think, you know, I'm a worship leader too, and so, you know, we write songs about, you know, we're, we're slaying the giants in the land, and we use all this language, you know, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I'm afraid to go to church. And it just, our, our theology was not lining up, like our songs weren't lining up with our actions, you know? It was like, it would, like, we sing about the sick being healed, the dead being raised, people getting touched, like the light invading darkness, and the moment where we can actually prove our songs, many of us didn't show up. And so, you know, and, and I'll say this too, and I love the worship movement, and I love the creatives, and I am one, but they were probably hit the hardest, you know, whereas they felt like they had to kind of form to a certain uh, 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 agenda, shall I say, and that compassion look like putting a mask on and watching the live screen at home in your room. When, and, and people actually tried to build theology around that. Like, this is what Jesus would do. And I'm like, what Jesus are you reading? I mean, he walked into sickness. He walked into darkness. He walked into the demonic. And he brought freedom. And he brought healing. And he brought hope. And so, you know, that, that was the first thing that shocked me. I'm like, I, I'm like, this is testing the core of our theology. Do we believe in the very songs we sing? And so it was, it was yeah, it was cra crazy. And then the Great Awakening happened, right? Yes. And so it was lockdowns and then the Great Awakening where all of a sudden you automatically, Sean, had to be posting a black square. Mm -hmm. You had to be apologizing for things you never did because of the color of your skin. And in some of the church circles you run in, that was a pretty prevalent kind of, you must do this. We're going to show up at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning and do the BLM march, and if you disagree, you're a bad person, you're a racist. All the while, you're trying to get people to say, wait a second, can we worship? No, 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 we don't do that. The church is closed, but the protest is open. Like, walk us through that, and kind of, because you took a pretty hard stance against kind of this whole woke, CRT, you know, anti-family belief of BLM. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, I think... Um you know, the, the, the woke agenda was, was really a cop-out because it's like people pretending that they're virtuous and they have compassion, and, and, and they're trying to guilt people. Like, it's a guilt mechanism, right? That's not how the gospel works, right? It's grace. There's freedom. There's love. But wokeness demands that you comply to a certain narrative, or we shame you. And churches were using this. We're weaponizing this, you know? And you know, it's not like I, I have the personal history of being in the nation's uh, personal history. I mean, we have a, I have a team right now of 32 doctors on the ground in Iraq in a refugee camp, you know? And it's like none of that mattered because I was white and I was this white supremacist and I was trying to capitalize on the pain of whatever. Thank God that we had such a diverse, beautiful group of people. I mean, every gathering we had was incredibly diverse. And I think that alone shattered, the, you know, the, the, the media and, and the woke powers that be want you to buy into the narrative that we're disunified according to our race. I've been to 160 cities across America to testify something different, you know? Um, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite moments, and this happened a bunch, but we were in Chicago and, you know, these BLM protesters came out. They probably said they were Christians. I don't know. And they came out to protest our, our meeting in South Chicago, and, and they were screaming and yelling and screaming my name and everything, and they didn't know that, like, that day we had three black pastors that were preaching the gospel. So the first one got up, and he said, hey, man, young man, let me tell you something. And he started preaching the gospel, forgiveness. You need to release your offenses. And that white, angry protester came down to the altar, gave his life to Jesus. We baptized him in the back of a truck bed. And so... What I've found is that, is that people were sucked into this narrative because I think genuinely, Charlie, like, I think our generation is born with a, with, a, with a call for justice, right? I think we're just born with that. We want a cause to live for. We want to live for justice. We want to do things for the kingdom. And the, the world just literally perverted that in this last season and told us the only way to do that is according to our rules. The only way to do that is according to how we say, and it was a guilt, shame mechanism that many people fell for. And I'm telling you, we gotta get back to the centrality of the gospel, which is forgiveness and grace. We don't mandate that people comply with some 
black square thing or whatever it was. You know, it was very manipulative in my opinion. And it was all rooted in guilt and it was people that didn't know how to deal with guilt, right? right. Uh, a, a legitimate Christian, a real Christian, you should be walking around without guilt because you're born new, you're born free. God can't even remember your sins is what the right. scriptures say once you are born new. Um, so let it, me ask you, go ahead, Tron. Yeah. Well, no, and it, it also demanded, it, it, it wanted, wokeness wanted love without truth. You know, it wanted, it wanted a measure of love, you know, love is love is love is love is love is love is love without the truth of Jesus, without the truth of the gospel, without the truth of salvation, and so many people fell for it. Yeah, so a lot of churches fell for it, a lot, some pastors fell for it. It's, where do you think we stand now with that? You know, how, how deep is the woke infiltration of the modern church. Obviously, this, this church stands on the gospel and stands on truth and fights for liberty. But, you know, Sean, you visit a lot of churches. I do too, but you probably have a better picture. Where does it stand now? You know, I, I think we're, there's definitely a polarization. Um, I, I don't think we have to, you know, talk about certain movements that once had galvanized the church because even the press is annihilating them as being frauds, right? I think right now the biggest issue is people feel bad, but they don't want to repent or change because of their pride from what they believed in before. They're just trying to carry on like nothing happened. And I'm kind of like, well, hey, listen, remember we warned you about that? Hello, 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 you know? So there is a polarization, I think, in the church. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I think if you look at, you know, revival history or if you look at uh, moves of God in the past, I think polarization has always preceded revival. So I used to hate it. I don't hate it as much anymore. So walk us through that. That Give us some examples how polarization precedes a revival. Well, me and, and Pastor were talking in the back there. I mean, re revival rarely comes in, in times of perfect peace. It rarely comes in times of prosperity. It rarely comes in times where, I mean, you know, Matthew 24 says that Jesus pulls no punches. He says, listen, it's, there's gonna be wars, there's gonna be rumors of wars, hello, season we're in. There's gonna be famines, there's gonna be earthquakes, there's gonna be all this stuff, but take heart, don't be alarmed. Tell someone next to you, don't be alarmed. Don't be caught up in the hysteria of it. It's going to happen, and guess what? I got news for you. It's gonna get worse. But that's okay, because we were born for such a time as this, right? But, but the thing that Charlie, it says in Matthew 24, then Jesus says a couple verses later, he says, and, and, and the increase of wickedness will cause the love of many to grow cold. Because of the increase, because of the chaos, because of the confusion, because of the agendas, many people are gonna get caught up in it. And the love of many is gonna grow cold. I mean, how many people do we know in lockdowns or in the uh, civil unrest, they just left the church, they just left God, they just left everything, you know? The love of many will grow cold, but then it says this promise, that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in every nation, tribe, and tongue. It's gonna happen. Not an emperor, not a governor, not a man. I mean, that's the thing. We stood there in the Capitol in, in Sacramento, and we, you know, we gathered 12,000 people in Sacramento on the steps of the Capitol. Our permit, I think, was only for 500. But, <laughs> and, and I just said, listen, I, I wanted to sing that song. You know that song you, you learn as a kid? Pharaoh, Pharaoh, ooh, baby, let my people go. But, come on, any Assembly of God people out there, you know what I'm talking about. Because I'm like, Gavin Newsom, who do you think you are? The church never allows the government to tell us when and how to worship God. You know? And the polarization, the government, the intensity, you know, uh, I mean, we're living in it right now. And I, I think it's going to get worse. Joel prophesied. Joel 2, it says it's the great and terrible day of the Lord. You can focus on how terrible it is, or you can focus on how great it is. I love to focus on how great it is, because it is a season of historic revival. So, Sean, you know, some of both of our um, kind of Christian counterparts, they would, they would push back. They'd say, you know, you guys talk about America and politics too much. Just focus on the gospel. 
you know, you're, but you, we're talking, of course, to Sean, who's brought thousands of people to the Lord, and, you know, we talk about the gospel every single week on our podcast, on our radio show. You know, it's a big part of what we do. How do you, how do you navigate that? How do you push back against that? When you have an American, you know, flag patch on your sleeve, you're unapologetically American, you talk about the virtues of this country, and you're able to weave that into the teachings of the gospel. You know, a lot of people in this audience probably have people in their life that, you know, other Christians that say, I'm not into that, I don't care about America, come on. I, I just care about the gospel. Help us through that. Well, one funny thing is, you know, we get called everything, Christian nationalist, this, this, that, that, and then, and then all of a sudden, those same people are like, stand for Ukraine. <laughs> anyway, I won't go down that, that, I'm not gonna go down that, you guys know what I'm talking about, but, you know, what happened last night is a perfect example, Charlie. Every Senate Democrat but one, every single Senate Democrat, but this is the polarization I was telling you guys about right now. Every Senate Democrat for one voted for the most fanatical extreme abortion bill in the history of our nation. Every one but one voted yes on it last night in the Senate to allow abortion up until the moment of birth. That would put us in great company, North Korea, China, so you look at that and you think, how, 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 like, how can we as believers, how can anybody as a believer vote on that platform? When every single person on that platform comes into agreement with the shedding of innocent blood. This is not the, the blue dog Dems of the, of the, you know, this is a season of incredible polarity. And so I think, you know, and, and Charlie, I'm saying this as somebody that, dude, I organized prayer meetings across America for years. You know, we did 24 hour prayer meetings. We gathered in 2000 with five, you know, almost 500,000 people on the mall in DC. We prayed for the ending of Roe v. Wade. And at some point I felt the Lord say, Hey, it's great to pray about it. Why don't you do something? Why don't you put feet to your prayers? Why don't you engage, you know? And so that's why I ended up running for Congress. And I feel like this is the season of action. Like we can't, we can't stand by. America is an amazing nation. You know, I've been to 70 nations around the world. There's not a place like it. Historically, it's brought the greatest propagation of the gospel of any, of any nation in the history of humanity. It's not even debatable. And so why should we not fight for the destiny of this nation? Just like, you know, David, you read the book of Psalms. There's a lot of Psalms where David's singing about Israel. He's singing not songs to God, songs to Israel. Telling everybody how much he loves Israel. Telling everybody how much he wants to see God's promises over Israel. Why should we not want that in the nation where our kids are going to grow up in? Why should we not want this to be a prosperous nation? You know? So I feel like it is the time to engage. We have to. We're salt and light. We cannot allow the political space to be the one sphere where Christ is not being felt and known and seen. And, and that's part of the, the spirit that we want to try to instill. Um, America's a different type of country. Our core tenant is yeah. liberty. In God we trust, e pluribus unum. It's the American trinity. So we all know the Christian trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. We don't talk about the American Trinity, and this is Dennis Prager's theory, which is just phenomenal, which is on every coin you can see the American Trinity, and all three are biblical values. Liberty, God wants you to live freely. In God we trust. That's a core value of the Christian faith, obviously, you know, in, it's all throughout the Bible. Uh, and then number three is e pluribus unum, which is a Latin phrase, which means out of many, one. And it goes to a Christian verse that we all know, which is nor slave, nor Greek, nor Jew. We are all free in Jesus Christ. America was founded on those three ideas, liberty, in God we trust, and e pluribus unum. They're minted on our coins, they're on our currency. Everything that we believe comes from those three ideals. Show me any Christian doctrine that is widely accepted that, you know, in mainstream Christianity that would not say we believe in those three things. And show me another country where those three things are said, that's, that's so important we're going to put it on our money, on our currency. It, it doesn't exist. And, you know, God wants us to live in a state of freedom. He wants to set the captives free. Uh, that's why I love the story of Exodus so much, and you know, kind of very similar to what you were talking in Sacramento, is there is a yearning in the human heart to want to be free. And what came after the story of Exodus is uh, equally as important, it also is in the book of Exodus, which is once people are free, which you're seeing right now, now that all these restrictions are lifted, Sean, what happened once the, 
the people of Israel were in the desert, they started complaining again. They said, wait a second, why are we in the desert? Who's this Moses guy? You bring us back to Egypt because at least we ate meat when we were in Egypt. They basically said, we wanna go back to slavery because we had better food. And so there's this tension in the human heart to wanna be free and wanna be taken care of. And it would be easy, Sean, you've traveled 70 countries, to just have someone wanna take care of us, to give us stuff, to be able to blame people for our problems. Um, and so, Sean, help us through that from a biblical theological perspective. Give us some more support, yeah. kind of, that informs your, you know, your, not political, but philosophical approach to these ideas yeah, and issues. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. I, you know, I always think in America, you know, the church gets so geeked out, right, when Cooper Cup scores the game-winning touchdown in the Super Bowl, right? Well, not in Arizona, but in L.A., right? SoCal. And, and then he gives this speech about how much he loves God, and he has this amazing story about how him and his wife do Bible studies, and he's a good guy, right? We get pumped when Kanye West does an album, Jesus Christ is King, or whatever it was, Jesus is King, or whatever. We get pumped when, you know, a, a billionaire professes their faith, and we're like, that's our God, that's our God, yeah, that's amazing. But the moment a Christian runs for politics... Like, I live this, okay? So I have a little bit of authority to talk about it. Like, the moment that a, like, everything else is fine. All other spaces are fine. But the moment when a Christian runs for politics, I mean, I had friends that I like, I was like, these guys are gonna back me, right? We talk in the back room about these issues. We're all in one accord. The moment a Christian takes a stand in politics, it's like, ooh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that. What's he doing this for? I don't, I don't know about that, you know? And, and it's like, it's un, I think it's actually demonic, man. I think that there is this thing in the church where the enemy has so messed up our churches and our theology to not allow Christians. Let, think about it. Say there's seven spheres of society, right? There's only one sphere that regulates all the other spheres. We experienced that in COVID. <laughs> Who controls our lives? Where you can go, when you can have church, what you can do. And if we don't have Christians represented, if we're not salt and light in the one sphere that controls all other spheres, how are we faithfully responding to the Great Commission? So, growing up as a missions kid, I just thought, well, I'm gonna be a missionary in Congress. Like, honestly, that was my heart. Like, I, like the Lord sent me into closed nations before. God can send me wherever he wants to go. When I gave Jesus my yes, I told him I'll go anywhere. The greatest price I ever had to pay, my family ever had to pay, when I gave Jesus my yes to go into politics. The darkest space I've ever encountered out of any nation in the world is a space of politics. And it's because Christians are afraid to represent Jesus in that space. Anyway, that's intense, but it's true. Well, why do you think that that's the case? I think because, because there's too much dualism where we separate that. We separate politics from our faith, and it's like that's not actually the Hebraic way. All of our life, right? Jesus gets all of our life, every space of our life. Don't bring Jesus into the ballot box. Oh, yeah, bring Jesus into the ballot box. Don't bring Jesus into your politics. Yeah, bring Jesus into your politics. I mean, look at the founding fathers. You know, I mean, th this is our call as Christians, and so, you know, my pushback against that is, when you see like what happened last night in that Senate vote, it's impossible to be a believer and not like absolutely rise up. You go, hold on a minute. What? Every single Senate Democrat but one wants babies to die up until the moment of birth? I'm not okay with this. We gotta hold the line. Turn to someone and say, hold the line. <laughs> 
So, so Sean, before we open it up for questions, um, kind of just give a charge to the regular everyday people, people that are homeschooling, people that are on the front lines. You know, you've seen and heard a lot. You know, give, give a word of encouragement what you're seeing happening across the country right now in the fight for liberty. Yeah, so, so guys, I'm, I'm so encouraged. Um, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged because the enemy overplayed his hand. And this is not like, I'm not just, you know, making like this is preacher stuff. No, I've seen it. I've seen 7,000 people gather in downtown Portland. I've seen 10,000 people gather in Nashville. We had the largest church service in 2020 in America. 40,000 peep believers showed up at the height of COVID, 45 degrees in the rain. The, the enemy overplayed his hand. He wanted to kick us out of our church and we just said, okay, fine. The church has left the building. We don't want just the church anymore. We want it all. We want the gospel of the kingdom to invade every part of society. We want to see Jesus in the schools again. We want to see prayer come back in schools. We want to see the presence of God in business. We want to see, and this is the season we're in. It's a revival in our society. It's a revival in our society. We're not going back to the way it was. We're not going back to the pre-COVID church. We're not going back. We're not going back. And I'm telling you, and I'm just going to pray over you, and then we'll do q and I want to pray over you. Just stand up real quick. I want to pray over you. Because I want to pray over you. Listen, I'm not saying this. This is not just nice, you know, rah-rah, you know, speech. I've seen it with my own eyes. You name the hardest city in America, I've seen God move there. No place is too hard and no place is too dark. And we can't even be in, you know, I was, I was in Miami over New Year's. We had Governor DeSantis come, who's amazing, and, and had him come. And he looked at me and he said, he said, well, why don't you just move everything to Florida? We're the free state. We're free. Everything's free. And I'm like, well, I'm like, that's amazing. I would love that. But who's going to fight for California? We also can't be the conservatives and the Christians that run to places that are easy. That's not the gospel either. He's sending us into the difficult places, and I believe this is the year where we're gonna see a turnaround. We're gonna see it politically, but we're gonna see it spiritually, amen? So God, I just thank you, Lord, that there is an awakening happening right now in our nation. Lord, and I pray over every person out here, God, these beautiful people that love America and they love you. I pray today, God, that you would fill them with boldness. Lord, we thank you that it says in Proverbs that the righteous are as bold as a lion. I pray today, God, that they would be filled with boldness and courage and optimism. Even right now, we don't even know what's going on with the State of the Union. Praise God. But Lord, we tell you, we have a better report we have a better report of what you're doing on the earth. And I pray today it would be a day of boldness. It would be a day of courage. And Lord, based upon the testimony of what I've seen across America, we say this is the year of awakening in our nation. We believe it. We believe it in Jesus' name. Come on, just give a shout. Just give a shout tonight. Sean Boyd, everybody. Everybody, please take a seat and let's do some questions. You guys can line up in the aisle. And uh, as people line up, Sean, uh, talk a little about how people could follow you and support the great work you're doing. We have two lines of questions, and students get priority. So if you're a student, yeah. you guys uh, get priority. We want to hear from you, hear what's going on. Uh, Sean, really quick, how people can follow support yeah, you, and then think, we'll start over there. I think they have some slides. You can throw them up if you have them. But um, you can follow us on social media. Um, on, on your way outside, you can grab... Uh, some of our Let Us Worship merch and gear and hoodies. These are the cities we're going to. Throw them up there. Uh, these are the cities we're going to be going to. 12 cities across America uh, that kicks off in Lafayette and the Cajun Dome. And it ends in on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. We just secured the permit for the National Mall a week and a half before the midterms. So I expect all you sunny Arizona people to join us for a wild party. Of course, we're going to New York. Philly, we got the, uh, we got the uh, square, the independent square where the Liberty Bell hangs. We got that reserved. It's gonna be an epic year. We're going for broke. We're going for revival. Go to the next slide. I don't know what, what else you guys got, but 
Anyway. And it's uh, letusworship.us. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, letusworship.us or seanfoyt.com. Oh, one more thing. We're getting heavily censored right now, of course. Shadow banned because, you know, dangerous content. The gospel's dangerous, you know. So um, follow us on, on, on social media, but you can also text 2021. Sean to 2021. If you text that, you can join our, our, our text thread and, and our email list and all that kind of stuff. So do that, and it would be amazing. Perfect. All right, let's start here. Hi. So recently, there's been a lot of talk of a national divorce, and uh, I was just wondering what you think about that. Slash, do you think we're headed for a civil war? Yeah, so I've done a lot of uh, talking about this, and I'll, I'll do some more. By the way, um, we had, uh, yeah, Sean doesn't want to answer this. That's fine. Let him answer. Yeah, that's fine. I, I specialize in the tough stuff. So um, I'll, bring, I'll bring Sean back to pray, and then I'll do the other stuff. So um, yeah, national divorce, you know, civil war, sure, why not? Um, so yeah, look, I've done a couple podcasts on this. So let me first, I have to preface by saying this, a national divorce would be awful. It'd be terrible. I don't want to see this country torn apart. We are a union of 50 states. The states created the federal government. The federal government did not create the states. But we'd be fooling ourselves if we did not take a step back and ask ourselves, what are the ties that bind us together to our fellow countrymen in Manhattan and San Francisco right now? Let me give you an example. We believe the Constitution is a wonderful political document. They think the Constitution is trash, most of them. We believe marriage is one man and one woman. They believe that marriage is whatever you want it to be. We believe in rights given by God. They don't even believe in God. We believe in borders. They, don't, they, they believe in open borders. I could go on. Uh, we, we, a lot of times we don't even speak the same linguistic language, right? Where English becoming an increasingly uh, minority language in some of these areas. So you have to ask yourself the question, what is it that ties us together to your fellow citizen? Well, it's the dollar. Okay, well, what happens when the dollar becomes increasingly devalued, which we're seeing in real time? And you might have a currency reset. The point that I, I'm getting at is we're on a much more fragile cultural footing than I think people actually want to say out loud. When I go to Los Angeles, I have to go with armed guards and the whole, you know, whole thing for death threats and all that. I don't feel as if I'm visiting a country where I share values with in any way, shape, or form. I see more schools that are protesting in favor of BLM, you know, this kind of woke LGBT agenda. And I ask myself, you know, half the country looks at that completely different. Now, the way we avoid a national divorce, and I'll get to the Civil War question in a second, which would be a tragedy, is actually if the other side just decided that they don't want to impose their viewpoint on us. A lot of this would simmer down, right? A lot of this would simmer down if you have difference of opinions, like, okay, the people in Alabama, they see the world the one way. We in Malibu, we see the world one way. Whatever, we're not going to go anywhere. The problem is they are relentlessly trying to push this stuff outwardly in places that don't share their values. And they're almost trying to provoke a response. So they're going to Birmingham, or they go to Scottsdale, and the next thing you know is they're having your children in Scottsdale fill out forms that could potentially tattle on their parents on whether or not they're being compliant with CRT-type guidelines or woke agenda, which was something they mistakenly said, you know, sent into parents. So there's almost this imperialist mindset by the American left. And so the way we must respond um, and we must respond by saying that we want to keep the country together. There's more that unites us than what divides us. But I have called for quite some time. We must realize that the center of power on the American left is actually not a majority of people. I really don't believe a majority of people believe men can become pregnant. I don't. However, I believe that the people that believe men who could become pregnant are powerful people. They run Apple, for example. Your Apple iPhone has a pregnant man emoji. I don't know if you know this or not. It's a huge debate. They came out with it, obviously. Don't update. Yeah. Don't update. Obviously, one of the most important things Apple could be worrying about, right? Now, there's all, that can only go on for so long. I have called for a while that we need a political extinction event of the woke left. We need to make it unacceptable to believe, for example, that we should judge people based on the color of their skin, that men can become pregnant, that we should have segregated classrooms. Like in Colorado, they have playtime at playgrounds only for black families and white families are not allowed. Like this garbage has got to stop. 
And I believe most Americans are looking for an outlet or a vehicle to repudiate that and want a return to team reality. The Civil War thing, here's what I do believe. Most Americans don't want a Civil War. I don't think we will get to a Civil War unless, for whatever reason, the other side tries to provoke people and the people on the right aren't disciplined enough to realize that they're trying to tempt you into something fake to justify a security response and return. I've said this openly before. Don't take the bait. Satan would love nothing more than to try to have you get into a conversation or a political dialogue that would then all of a sudden say, hey, we have to get more power at the FBI or DOJ to take care of these people that want to tear the country apart. We must be explicit unifiers. We must be always trying to bring people together on things that are agreeable and that are part of the American Trinity. How's that for addressing a pretty controversial topic? All right, thank you. Hey, I have a question for Sean. Um, how did you get your start with Bethel Music and what was that whole experience like? Uh, what were some highlights of that? And do you have a method for getting alone with the Lord and getting in a creative space, whether it's lyric writing or uh, on guitar or just that in general? Yeah, um, I, I never wanted to be a worship leader or like all my family are doctors, like besides me, I don't, guess I couldn't measure up. Um, but I, I really did love worship and I loved the presence of God and I loved um, the fact that I could learn a few chords and, and have that time of worship in, in, in myself. And so anyway, one thing led to another and I started leading worship and never wanted to be on a label, but God just opened doors. And I think that for me, um, I think especially in COVID and, and even the Let Us Worship movement, if you guys have ever been, um, that's a big part of what we do, you know? It's just worship. It's not a precursor to something. It's not a get us ready for the preaching thing. It is the main thing, you know? It is how we bring heaven to earth. It is how we change our hearts. It is how we can live with sanity in this crazy world, you know? Um, so for me, I think, you know, I have to make sure to carve time to get, to get alone with the Lord and to be intentional about it. I, I wish I could say there's some, you know, uh, magic way to do it, but I think it just comes down to being really intentional, and I have four kids in a crazy world, but, you know, I have to maintain that creative space, and I think the, on the creative end, opportunities will come and opportunities will go, but whether I'm on a label or off a label, I actually kind of like it better now, because I can do whatever I want. Um, uh, you know, I just, just follow the Lord and the doors that he opens, so I hope that answers it, yeah. Thank you. Hello, Sean and Charlie. I just want to know, because you guys are very influential with people, and you guys are able to speak with people so well, and just want to know, like, how can, like, a person like me be able to speak into the hearts of people and to really attract them? Yeah, so, look. Your shirt's a good start. I like yeah. the shirt. <laughs> You're doing good there. Um, yeah, so I, you, you said specifically to, about speaking. You know, someone asked me the other day, um, you know, I was just getting an IV at Prana. I think our Prana friends are here somewhere. If you guys ever need an IV in the valley, they're amazing. Check them out. Uh, I was just there a couple hours ago. Uh, they're, oh, they're back there. And uh, they're wonderful. And I would, you know, they, they said that I'm a good speaker. I said, look, when you do 15,000, 20,000 speeches, you know, it's hard to be bad at it after that. Um, you know, it's, I used to get nervous when I had to speak way back when. Um, you know, 10 years ago and, you know, 12 years ago when I first started this. And that's perfectly normal. It is. Um, and I say this, I believe any person can become a good public speaker. I really believe that. Um, and you need to have passion and you need to be interesting. And you also need to prepare. Uh, a lot of public speaking is preparing and knowing what you're talking about ahead of time. And there's a multitude of opportunities. This is what I tell young people all the time. They say, you know, Charlie, I don't know what I want to do. I say, if you, be, if you get okay at public speaking, you can be a very successful person because most people don't want to do it. Most people don't want anything to do with public speaking. It's a huge differentiator. So you ask specific about speaking into that. Uh, that's really important. But also, um, you know, you have to know what you believe and why you believe it. And to spend a lot of time learning and diving deep into those ideas. Sean. Yeah, um, I, I would just say I think a, a lot of the, the gifts and, 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 you know, that you want to excel at or you want to become better at, I think it comes down to stewardship, you know, and it's like what do you have in front of you? Who are you influential to right now, you know? 
And how can you steward that influence, you know, to be all that God's called you to be? And it's amazing how the Lord will begin to build that. Because, you know, despite the popular belief, God doesn't, doesn't run on communist principles. Everyone's not given the same. I mean, it's just the Bible. Some are given five, some are given 10, some are given, I'm not given Charlie's brain, right? And I don't have his hair. That's true. <laughs> Perfect example. Perfect. You know, and, and, and so, but yet, but yet the Lord actually takes from the one that does nothing with it and gives to the one that is a good steward. And so that's my encouragement to you, man, is like wherever that sphere of influence is, you know, do everything that you can do to steward that well and watch God bring an increase to it. Yeah, and I'll just say this is that, you know, this is just more general advice to young people is that some people get resentful because they say, I don't have the skills that other people have. You know, I grew up with some superstars that were so unbelievably talented and they made some decisions and they're not superstars anymore. They had the raw talent where they could have been CEOs and they could have been unbelievable. But the people that, you know, I grew up with, some of them that were always worked hard, but they would have just been, you know, I don't know if I have all the skills and they're like rock stars 10 years later. I tell, it's about work ethic, it's about values, it's about integrity, it's about application of those things and constantly trying to be a better person. So I hope that's helpful, thank you. Hello, so my question revolves around something that was mentioned earlier, the idea that the political sphere is the only sphere that Christians really aren't trying to dive into, uh, or I should say kind of fear, but as we've seen with life, we see the, the music industry, the uh, entertainment, sports, even like with all the criticism against Tim Tebow, all these industries and spheres that are so influential on our lives are being attacked constantly. And so for, I'm and speaking for everybody in here, we don't necessarily have the influence that you guys do. So kind of bouncing off the previous question as well, how do we as individuals with lesser influence attack these spheres that are so secular and start bringing Jesus into the hearts and minds of the people around us. You know what flipped Virginia? You know, um, I, I lived in Virginia throughout high school. It's been blue, blue, blue. Who flipped Virginia? It wasn't Trump, it was parents, right? That were unafraid to raise their voice. You know, and I'm telling you, they, I, I believe this, and I don't know, Charlie, if you agree with me, but I think 2022 is the year of parents, man. Parents are not playing games, and they're just normal people, ordinary people. They don't have big social media followings. They're not, you know, but they get up there. And, I mean, you don't mess with a mama bear. I mean, for real. You do not mess. Even Jesus was, you know, his mom. You remember the story where Jesus was like, hey, it's not my time. And his mom goes, oh, I'll tell you when it's your time. <laughs> You're going to turn that water into wine right now, you know. So... <laughs> That's, that's my Mother's Day sermon. It's a good one. Um, I'll come back and preach, pre preach my Mother's Day sermon. No, but I, I, my, going back to it, I, I think, you know, we underestimate the power of boldness and what it does. It just takes one person to take a stand, and that's what we saw in Virginia to flip the whole state. So I think this is the year we're going to see that more. Yeah, and I'll just expand on that, is that, you know, don't, don't look at influence as numbers, as, me, as many people as you can. I know a lot of people that have big social media followings, but they really don't influence that many people. It's just they have people, they follow them because they're clowns or whatever. It, you know, it's, it's better to have five or six people that you influence on a very quality way. And God will bless that and honor that. And if you are trying to look for the numbers, like I wanna influence millions and millions of people, first you have to understand that comes with a tremendous cost. I just have to just say, it takes a lot of work and you'll come under a lot of attack. Maybe that's something you want. But it really is not something that is impossible for the everyday person if you apply in that way. Become a master at one or two things, a topic that really interests you, right? It could be immigration, it could be abortion, it could be whatever it is. And you're like, no matter what, like I might not be able to know everything about every topic, but I'm gonna try to win influence in this one thing. And anytime this thing comes up, I'm going to be the mover and the shaker in that category or that topic or that issue. Um, and I, I think that's really important because if you look at, to kind of piggyback off Sean's example, it was all around education in, in Virginia, right? It was all about parents getting involved in education and kind of all, all the uh, involvement in that. So thank you so much for your question. Really appreciate it. I just want to ask, uh, what was the time that 
attacked you and rejected you the most when you were protesting, and why? Who was the one that attacked me the most? Oh, the town? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, whew. sorry, the state. The state. The what? The state. Well, we were number one uh, on the governor's website in Wa the state of Washington. We were the number one COVID breakers um, on his website. Um, you know, Gavin Newsom released these ordinances they call the Sean rules. Um, I could go on and on. No, I, I think honestly, the, the, what shocked me the most was the sheer demonic violence that I witnessed in Seattle and Portland. I've never seen that in America before. And, you know, the, the, the fact that, pe like, that was actually a spirit, yeah. right? People, like, I mean, they, they're crazy, right? They were, they were macing and pepper spraying babies that showed up at our events. They were throwing spikes in the road so that car tires would explode as people left gathering to worship, you know? Surrounded my wife and kids at one point with knives in their back. You know, we have, we're, we have a documentary coming out, not to plug that, but sharing the whole story. You know, it's gonna be wild for Americans to really see what happened. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of intensity, but you know, we persevered and, 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 and we stood up and we worshiped God and breakthrough came and people got saved and people got healed and people got delivered. And so it was really worth it. It was really worth it. I like your hat. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right. Uh, my name is Kenny. Uh, so you both are fathers, so I guess I'm just asking. Not yet. He's a father. I'm a husband. So. Oh, okay. You're being prophetic, then, then though. He wrong. might be a father. Okay, there we go. Soon to be father, then. Uh, what advice would you give to parents uh, in today's society on protecting their children? As far as parenting, like obviously going to schools, but as far as parenting, as protecting our, child, our children from the lies that the society is trying to tell them? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was watching my kids the other day, actually just yesterday, um, and I don't know, just having a moment, maybe some of you parents have felt this, and I just kind of overwhelmed. I'm like, they are facing things that I never faced. I mean, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I mean, we had some stuff, but nothing like they're facing. You know, the perversion, the levels of, uh, of, of that they want to mess up their identity, and I was just, yeah, the gender stuff, the confusion, the... And I just was, I was like, God, how are they gonna make it? And you know, I have all blonde haired kids. That's all we make is like blonde haired, blue eyed kids. And, and they're just running on the beach in their innocence. And I'm just thinking, they don't even know what they're up against. Anybody ever felt like that? Any parents ever felt like that? And I heard the Lord say, really, and this was like powerful to me. Like I heard the Holy Spirit say, Sean, I created them for such a time as this. I created, I fashioned them. And so I think one is never, never parent from fear. Never parent because you're afraid of the boogeyman and the enemy, right? Be, be cautious, be careful, but know that God's given them a spirit inside of them that is powerful, right? My daughter, she's 11 years old. She is a praying, prophesying machine. She will walk up to any all in here and give you the greatest prophetic word you've ever had in your life, you know? She knows Jesus, right? And, and we just keep getting them in the atmosphere where they can get filled up by God, where they can encounter God, where they can get marked by God. I believe that's the difference maker. And then, of course, don't let them learn any of that crap, you know, in secular and public education. We wanted to control, in COVID, we really wanted to control and, and be able to steward the environment, right, of them as they walk through the pandemic. And so we took them out of school because one day you have to wear a mask, the next day you can't go. One day, you know, it's like, we're like, you know what, we're not gonna do this. We are gonna party with God. And so we took them on the road with us and they experienced revival across America. We homeschooled in a camper. We did it out of hotel rooms. And they'll never forget that season. So I, I, that's my encouragement is just don't, do it, don't parent from fear. Know that God's got you, but also use wisdom. It's awesome. Well, I, I could just, I mean, I'm not, not a father yet, but I could say that yet. Um, from, the, from the turning point perspective of helping parents all across the country, you know, with the educational piece, yeah. uh, which is so incredibly important. Um, you know, parents, I say, 
if you spend one hour a week, this has been a challenge we've said before, spend one hour a week with all the devices off and teach your children something about American history or philosophy. Yeah. You might say, well, that's awfully intimidating. I'm just gonna keep on plugging this, and we've talked about some amazing educational options together, uh, but one that we've partnered with, charlieforhillsdale.com, I've said it before, it's a way that you guys can take these online courses, teach your kids the Constitution or American history, yeah. it's very important. Um, and so, take ownership of your kids' education. It might not be homeschooling. By the way, I think homeschooling is a great option, and God bless our homeschooling parents. But it might not be the right option for you. I get that. Then it's got one hour a week. If you can't dedicate one hour a week, then you know the, the battle is already lost. But think about that. That one hour a week is 52 hours a year that will be all about things of instilling those values that really matter, that will really make a tremendous impact. OK, next question. Hi, um, how hard was it to like stay faithful to God and not have the urge just to go home like after all the struggles? Oh, the struggles? Um, you know, uh, I think the hardest part was, you know, uh, it wasn't the opposition of, you know, the governors or mayors or Antifa or protesters. It was the distance of friends. And I think the distance and the desertion of friends, the relational component, um, I think was, I think it was really hard for Jesus, you know, in the garden where he's like, man, you guys couldn't just stay up one hour and have my back, you know? And I think that he, you know, he walk, he hasn't walked through anything that we, that we don't walk through, right? That's why he can meet us in our place of need, you know? And I think that that for me in that season, for me and my wife, that was the most difficult thing. But on the flip side, the most incredible thing about that was is that God opened new doors and new relationships and new connections. And, you know, here I am with Charlie talking about the amazing thing God's done. And I don't know if I would be there if we had not have taken that stand. So sometimes the relational disconnect is, is hurtful, but it's necessary. I don't know if that's helpful to some of you guys. I mean, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a eight, seven on the Enneagram. Like I'm an eight challenger, but the seven is like, let's party. I want everyone to party. Like, let's just party. Let's rage together. This is awesome. But this was a season where the eight came out and it was like, no, we need to challenge this spirit, you know, and I'm going to lose some friends in the meantime, but but I, I, we found God in it. So the hardest was the relational thing. I don't know, I'm sure you guys can identify that's always the most difficult, at least for me, um, but sometimes it's necessary. Thank you, man, appreciate it. Thank you, next question. Hi, um, my question for you guys is, I'm vice president at my school, um, I'm in student council, and people look up to me as a role model and a leader, but there aren't many Christians on my school, maximum probably seven. Wow. And it's very sad as me as a 13 year old. So my question for y'all is how can I help them become Christians but also be strong in their faith? What a beautiful question, isn't that? That's so terrific. First, I just want to encourage you that um, being 13 years old, and going through this, uh, you're, you're gonna be a formidable force for Jesus when you're 18, 20, or 30, I'll tell you what. Um, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Uh, you're gonna lose friends and you're gonna get bad things said at you. Maybe that's already happened, right? Um, Christians will get bullied. It's part of what we are guaranteed. It's part of our bargain. You know, we get salvation, then we get suffering here in life. Quite a, quite a momentary deal. So why do you do that? Well, look, we, we, we know what's really going on here. But here's the thing, is that you could rise above all that, and you should rise above all that. And I would just, you know, stay really anchored in the scriptures. Um, you know, my, my wife does a Bible in 365 ministry that helps people read the Bible in one year. She does a great job of that. Um, and I would, the more you dive into that and you are a ambassador for what it means to be a Christian and to be Christ-like, um, because that seven, I guarantee you, is actually probably even more, because some people are probably scared to say that they're Christians. They're scared to say that they believe what you believe. Um, but let's pretend it is just seven. There's no reason why that seven can't become 14 or 70 very, very soon and to multiply. And when Jesus talked about the parable of the talents, 
And he's talking about people like you. So you have the good news. You know, Jesus is your Lord and Savior, but you're in a pretty tough environment, right? Well, you're also in a position of leadership, though. That's awesome. And so people are gonna look up to you in times of pressure. So a good rule for life is pressure is when your values come out, okay? So you're, you could hide your values when you're like on vacation. Well, pre- vacations are really stressful, but like, you know what I mean? Like, you could hide your values when it's not tough. But when you get under pressure and there's a due date, and you gotta get your homework done, and your friend doesn't have the homework done, or you don't, he's like, hey, let's just cheat and get the answers in. That's gonna be pressure to find out whether or not you actually believe it or not, right? And that's gonna be an opportunity for you as a leader to be like, hey, we're gonna take the bad grade because it'd be worse to lie than to get a good grade with, you know, it, it would be worse to, to lie with a good grade than to not, so, but I just wanna encourage you, you're, you're 13 years old, and I'm telling you, this is a great example before Sean chimes in, there's a, there's a generation of superstars that are rising up, I'm telling you, that are younger and are tougher than anything we've seen. Sean? We're so proud of you. You're amazing. You're gonna be just fine. Thank you. God bless you, thank you so much. Hi, my name's Megan. Um, thank you guys for what you guys do. I just had a question in regards to something that I feel like it's not touched on a lot, and it's like, with the F Joe Biden and the let's go Brandon. So I used to kind of like say let's go Brandon a lot and my brother challenged me like, let's try to like revert away from saying that. And I'm like, why is that? And he goes, because as a Christian, like we want people to be known by our love. And at the end of the day, like we want justice to be shown but not compromising our morals. So I just kind of was curious what you guys thought. Yeah, about I think that. there's a time and place. I don't think there's, it's, a, it's the right place for churches to say that. I don't. I've said that, and some people have come after me. Um, I'll be honest. Um, you know, someone said the other day when I, I said, let's go, Brandon. They said, that's not very Christ-like. He said, you know what? I agree. Jesus was divine, and I struggle to control myself with the destruction of my country happening every single day. I completely admit it. No, I, I'm not defending it. I, it's, it's, it's cathartic. It feels good. It's fleshly. I'm not, def- I'm just saying, I say it, okay? And I'm not defending it by any way, but I I think the church has to rise above that. That's my own opinion. I'm not saying if pastors have said that before, they're in any way bad people. It's my own personal opinion. I think that, you know, there has to be standards, especially in a holy place of gathering, and Sean might agree or disagree, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of hypocrisy around the people that don't like that phrase, but I'll leave it there, um, because they were freely saying a whole lot of other stuff. Um, in church, by the way. Um, You know, a lot of people could say, well, why would you say, dang it, that means, or why would you say, shoot, because that means, really means this. You know, I don't, I think a lot of that is, I don't mandate that with people. Like, well, you have a Holy Spirit, you know, I'm not, we're not here to be religious people that, you know, and I agree with Charlie, I don't, I don't think, Church is the place for that, you know? I don't, I don't think it is. Um, but I think that we should not shy away at the same time from speaking the truth about that guy. <laughs> and, and let me say one other thing that, um, and, and anyone on my team will tell you, I, I, used to, I used to swear a lot, like five or six years ago, and I just prayed a lot, and I realized that the reason I was swearing is that it makes you feel really powerful in a minute as you're, as like that second you say it. And it's actually, it's, it's a sin of the flesh. It's not the worst sin of the flesh, but it is. Um, and we've really cleaned it up on my internal team. I have no tolerance for it at all whatsoever. Um, and I just challenge Christians. I don't like when pastors swear in their sermons. They, I think they think they're being cute or edgy. I think it's really dumb and foolish, honestly. Um, I think that we're called to be restrained and prudent and wise with our language. All of our podcasts and radio shows we do are always family friendly and clean. And I, w- I want you to think about it though. If you're, if you're not careful with those words that we all know, right, the seven worst words, then what other words are you not careful with, right? Because that's easy to say those words all the time, right? When you overhear conversations in bars and I think, wow, what is, are they, they're really not thinking through much of what they're saying, right? It's kind of, it, it almost, it, it descends the conversation kind of into this um, lower level. And I'm not moralizing. I know a lot of people struggle with swearing. I, I was there in my life and it, it's a habit and you get through it. And so I, I do think the church needs to continue to lead 
in that. And that's more just a general lifestyle thing. Um, and I find that this is not a rule of thumb, but if people that struggle with drinking also struggle with swearing, it's, a ve- it's connected. If you can't control what words you say, you're not gonna control what you put in your body. So it's something to think about. So thank you so much, I appreciate that. Okay, I think we're gonna just run through the list, uh, run through the line, yes. So I have a couple questions for Let Mr. Rip. Sean. Don't what, make them hard. What advice would you have to say for kids who struggle with friends who basically spend their time watching TikTok? With what? Watching TikTok. My kids will never get TikTok. No, no, no. Oh, I would say this. <laughs> this is what I would say. <laughs> I would say, you know what? There's something about being fascinated with Jesus that's amazing. I grew up in high school. How old are you? 12. 12, right? I'm telling you, rock stars, everybody. They're coming. So I grew up, I like your shirt, by the way. I grew up uh, as 12, 13 year old, 13, 14, and I got radically touched by Jesus. And I was so obsessed with God and everything that he had for me. I didn't really have a lot of time to do the things a lot of other kids were doing. And so I know friends that are on TikTok and are being a light and are engaging and are sharing amazing things. I think that's really good, you know? But you can't let it become an idol in your life. You know, Jesus is the only one to take that place. And so I think you just gotta pray and say, God, is this an idol? Maybe I need to lay it down. You know what's really good to do sometimes, especially when the trolls are bad, just for me, is like lay down social media for a little bit and just free yourself, because I think we're a whole generations walking around like this, they don't know how to function with each other, with normal people. So you could be countercultural and actually know how to hang out with real people. And, and there's a great paradox of social media that is really unhealthy. Here's what it is, is that extroverts actually don't like using social media because they're too busy doing things. They're hanging out with people and they're do, and introverts are always on social media. So we're platforming a lot of people that are actually not well-versed in social skills because they're staying at home, but they're on social media all the time. And the people that actually should be on social media that are more magnanimous and are actually people that, you know, would actually have good communic, not that they don't have bad communication skills. And and this is a rule of thumb. You meet people that are really, really good on social media, 90, and we deal with this at Turning Point USA, 90% of them are like super introverts. And you meet them and they like don't, they can't have a conversation. And they're making videos and they're screaming and they're yelling and they're doing, you know, you know, backward flops and the whole things, but you meet them, they, they can't say more, they're, like, they're just kind of mumbling. You're like, wow. And it's because that was actually what they did because they weren't comfortable going to be extroverts, right? So I actually think social media, the paradox is it creates a generation of kind of, it subsidizes introversion, um, which is okay to an extent, but there's a lot of antisocial tendencies that come with forced introversion. Um, and not everyone is, is actually does well as an introvert. In fact, some people need gathering and they need communication and they need connection and they need to be you know, outside of just looking at the prison. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you, men. All right, we'll try to get to two more if we can blitz through them, okay? Hello, thank you all uh, for being here with us tonight. Um, I wanna first say thank you, Charlie, for taking such an interest in Scottsdale, specifically with education. My name's Sarah Solem, and I have three young kids in the district, and um, we really appreciate all the support you've given us. You've really made sure, yes, thank you so much. You've really made sure to encourage all of us parents to get involved, and because of that, I've decided to run for Scottsdale's school board. How great is that? And I just wanna say thank you. So if you live in Scottsdale and you'd like to meet me, I will be in the back with my petition signatures. But during this time in education, there's such a divide. There's polarization on everything from curriculum to budget, transparency, ethics, and values. What do you say when you meet someone and they will not budge? So first, I just wanna say we are doing what we're doing to try to inspire people like you to do exactly what you are doing. I just wanna commend you and encourage you again. It's beautiful. Um, Look, the people that don't budge, try to win them over with your sincerity and your humanity, right? Some people are gonna be won over by the mind and the rational, like show me the budget. Most people are gonna be won over by things that Sean does, dancing on stage and the sincerity and the kind of, the heart. People will vote for you and support you because you're a mom with three kids and you're fed up with what's going on. 
very few people will go vote for you if it's like, yeah, I have a strong opinion on the budget reallocation. Like, okay, that's a portion of people, I guess, in Scottsdale. Most people are like, you know what? She's a crusader for the right things. I can see myself in her. Um, that's, that's the most effective way that I think you can communicate. And also, don't let the negative attacks get you down. They will come, they will be personal, they will be brutal, but here's the amazing thing. Look at all the friends you have around you just in this room. I mean, you have people that are gonna support you and get behind you, so thank you so much. And uh, we wanna get to one more question while we can, okay? Thank you. Um, were you in line, sir, or no? Oh, I'm sorry, you're good. Okay, last question. One quick question from a parent. Um, what can we do locally regarding all of the um, pot places, or I don't know what you call them. Um, no, I, I, I totally sympathize with this. And one, yes. one other question. I have young people that like to go to Dutch Brothers and get a drink, and I've noticed on occasion that there's people there that are doing something, I don't know what you call it. And uh, what can we do to, you know, smoking, whatever, vaping? Vaping, yeah. Okay. I'm not a fan of that either, so yeah. What can we do as parents, as local yeah. citizens, to come against this that's coming against our children. Yeah, so look, I, I, I'm starting to lose my patience with Scottsdale. Uh, if, if, this, if, if the town keeps on falling, I'm gonna get someone to run for mayor or I might just run for mayor. I don't wanna be mayor, trust me. I do not wanna be mayor at all, but no, I, I got way too much many problems to become mayor of Scottsdale, oh my goodness. Um, there should be no marijuana dispensaries in Scottsdale, period, end of story. It's ridiculous. The people of Scottsdale, by a 70 or 80% margin, don't want them. I could tell you this, c conclusively. My suburb of Chicago that I grew up in, Prospect Heights, Wheeling, they have marijuana dispensaries in every corner right across the street from Hersey High School, Wheeling High School. It will destroy your community. It br and I, I say this as nicely as I can. It brings in people that are the metaphorical bottom of the barrel. We don't want to talk about it. It's just the way it is, okay? It brings in people that are involved in crime, they're involved in other things, and so Scottsdale should become a marijuana dispensary free zone. Now they're like, oh, we're gonna lose the tax revenue. Like, really, you're worried about tax revenue? Have you seen the assessment of our properties lately? Everything's up 40%, you can't get a reservation at a restaurant north of Shea Boulevard, you're worried about tax revenue? Like, give me a break, no. So I, I would love to be part of this. Again, I got enough stuff going on. Someone's gotta lead the charge. This is where local politics can get really exciting, actually where it's like, you know what, in Scottsdale city limits, we are not gonna put up with a marijuana dispensary. It's bad for, by the way, it's bad for your property values, it's bad for your children, it's bad for crime, it's bad for all of it. And so, um, I don't know the status, I don't even know the mayor of Scottsdale, but I'm, and why I get so passionate about this, guys, I feel Scottsdale slipping the same way I saw the suburbs of Chicago slipping. I'm seeing it happen in real time. The little things become the big things. And the next thing you know, these beautiful places start to deteriorate. So uh, I can't help you on the vaping thing. I'm sorry. Um, it just seems to be really widespread. Sean, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, bring them to a lettuce worship thing. We'll get them free. Yeah, exactly. Um, but thank you so no, much. No, I, I think that, I, you know, America's addicted. I mean, we have an addiction issue. Opioids is the number one killer in our nation. People aren't talking about it. Uh, kids are addicted to vapes. And it's the stuff that they're they're doing, they're, stuff they're putting in vapes is insane. And right. so, you know, I, I think it's, it's, we see it every single city we go to, they throw their vapes on the stage, they throw drugs on the stage. The guy that I run with was in prison and a drug dealer and everything, and so he knows what everything is. I don't know what anything is, but he'll tell me that's crystal meth, that's, you know, crack pipe, that's this, and in every city in America, we see it. I mean, we have a problem with addiction. Yeah. And we need, people need to meet Jesus. We need old school altar calls. We need people to throw their drugs on the stage. We need to get free, so. Amen. Well guys, what a, great, what a wonderful Freedom Night in America. If you guys wanna hear all of these, we have them all cataloged on my podcast page. Thank you guys for subscribing to that. We deeply appreciate it. Please support Dream City and the wonderful offering tonight. And if you guys wanna help support the expansion of these biblical citizenship classes and what we're doing at Freedom Night in America, it's tpusa.com. Matt does a wonderful job for us uh, at TPUSA Faith. And everybody, give it up one last time for Sean Foyt. God bless you guys, we'll see you next month.